This video looks at reconstructive memory, which is one of the key theories that you need to know for the cognitive approach. Now, reconstructive memory suggests that memories are not exactly what has been encoded and stored, but are affected by prior knowledge and prior knowledge in the form of schemas. Reconstructive memory says that memories don't work like a tape recorder, so you don't record exactly what you've seen and then be able to play that back exactly the same as if you would if you were watching a DVD of a film you've seen before. Instead, it suggests that memory reconstructs or changes your memory. Now, we change our memories because we're trying to make our memories fit in with what we expect to happen, and this is called our schema. Now, a schema is a pre-existing uh, memory or a pre-existing expectation of what would happen in a certain situation. The more difficult a memory is to remember, then the more likely it is that elements will be forgotten or that your schema will make distortions to your memory. Now, I always say that schemas are like building blocks of memory because they grow as you grow up and have more experiences with different things. Now, schema is a key word that you need to be able to refer to when you're referring to Bartlett's reconstructive memory. Now, Bartlett suggests that we have a schema for all sorts of different things in life. So we will have a schema for what a criminal should look like, for example, or a schema for what counts as food. Now, this might change as you encounter a new type of food or you learn that you can eat a type of plant and then that goes into your pre-existing schema. If you look at the picture on the screen at the moment, for example, you can see that if we were to look at the schema for what would be involved with a picnic, now you would have a, an expectation that it might be in a field or you might have eaten sandwiches, you might have gone with your family. So a schema will interrupt when you expect something to have happened or your schema tells you what is supposed to have happened in a certain situation. Now, because of this, a schema might be used to fill in the gap in a memory, and this is called confabulation. Or a schema might even put pressure on your mind or on your memory to remember things in a way that fits in with your schema, so what you would have expected to happen. And as a result, this will remove or change details in your memory. Now, there are two changes that can happen here. We can either assimilate new information, which means that we change our schema to fit what we've just happened. So, for example, if your schema had the expectation that a robber would be a teenage boy and you've just seen an eight year old girl rob a shop, then you might assimilate that new information to your schema so that your schema will expect that a robber could be a male or a female. Or you will accommodate new information. And this is where your memory is changed to keep your schema or what you expected to happen intact. Now Bartlett tested his idea of reconstructive memory and this idea of schema in a study that he did called War of the Ghosts. Now the War of the Ghosts is actually a Native American ghost story with very unusual features and he chose this because it was culturally unfamiliar to the Western participants that he was testing. Um, so that would make it easier for him to examine the transformations. Now he asked 20 participants to read the story and then he used a serial reproduction task in which they recalled the story on several different occasions, so some after a couple of hours, days, weeks or even years. Bartlett found that in this process the story was distorted, so this means that it was changed by participants, and he found there were three main changes or patterns of distortion that took place. The first is this idea of assimilation or confabulation, in which the, the story became more consistent with what the participants would have expected based on their culture. So details were unconsciously changed to fit the norms of a British culture, so that the story to the participants made, made sense to them based on their cultural expectations. The story was levelled, which means it was made shorter by each retelling of the participants, so they omitted, so they ignored information that they didn't think was particularly important. And the third change was rationalisation, in which participants change the order of the story in order to make it make sense to them. Now, this is where they often change some of the details of the story as well. So, for example, some participants would recall that the participants were that the people in the story were on a boat rather than specifically referring it to as a canoe. Now, overall, the participants remembered the main themes. They got the gist of the story, um, but they changed the elements that didn't make sense to them or weren't familiar to them. And they changed them to match their own cultural expectations. So the story remained a story, but it was changed. Now, if we were to look at Bartlett's study as a supportive element of the theory of reconstructive memory, we can criticise the study because it didn't have a lot of experimental controls in. So, for example, where Bartlett was using a serial reproductive task, there was actually an occasion where he bumped into a student in the street two years later and asked him to recall the story there and then. Obviously, because Bartlett was interpreting the data himself as well, we could argue that it was subjective. Allport and Postman is another example of a study. Now, if you look at the picture on the screen, Allport and Postman showed this picture to participants. He asked them to do another serial reproduction task in which they would describe what the picture looked like to another participant. 
Now, in actual fact, when we look at the picture, we can see that the black character is very well dressed, much more respectable than the white character. But after a serial reproduction task, the participants recalled that the white participant, or the white person in the picture, was the one that was better dressed, and it was the black person that looked less respectable. Some participants even described the, part, the black character as holding a knife. Another example of experimental research that we can use to support the theory of reconstructive memory comes from Elizabeth Loftus. Loftus. Now, Loftus did a series of lab experiments, particularly looking at eyewitness testimony. She showed participants a film clip of a real car crash, and she did a standardised procedure, but her IV, the bit she manipulated, was the verb that the participants were asked in relation to the video clip that they'd seen. So, for example, some participants were asked how fast the car was going when they smashed into each other, or the participants were asked how fast the cars were going when they hit each other. Now, participants who were asked the question with the verb smashed recalled the cars travelling at higher speed, 40.8 miles per hour on average, as opposed to the participants who were asked the hit verb who recalled that the cars were going at 34 miles per hour. Now, Loftus uses this as evidence to see how changing that verb that's used in the question can actually mean that their memory is distorted. Now, Lottis and Palmer also asked the same participants a week later if they'd seen any broken glass in the film clip. Now, in fact, there wasn't any broken glass in the film clip. And the control group, who weren't asked about the speed of the cars, 12% of those correctly recalled that. 14% of the participants who were asked the verb hit recalled that. But 32% of the participants who were used the, word, the verb smashed falsely recalled that there was broken glass within the film. Now, Loftus argues that this is because we're reconstructing our memory, so we're changing them to incorporate the new information that we're finding out afterwards. And we incorporate our schemas. So, for example, you would expect broken glass if you've said that the car was smashed into each other and they were travelling at a high speed. It would be a logical expectation that there would have been glass at the scene. You cannot tell which parts of the memory are the original, though, or which parts are changed afterwards, because there's no way of going back to the original memory. So, for example, you don't know if they recalled there being glass originally before they were asked that their cars were smashed. Now, if we look at evaluating reconstructive memory as a theory, the best way to do this is to look at the evidence that supports the theory. So the idea of schemas has been supported by a lot of research, which have been lab studies like we've just looked at by Loftus, in which there were tight experimental controls, standardised procedures, quantitative data, making them objective and reliable. So if we repeated the experiment, we'd expect to find the same findings. However, if we look at Bartlett's research in particular, we, as discussed previously, it was not scientific. There was not a standardised procedure, and we could argue that because Bartlett interpreted his own conclusions, they could be subjective. Bartlett's research as well is unrealistic in the sense that the task was very strange to participants. It, wouldn't, it isn't something that they would expect to do every day. Therefore, we could argue that Bartlett's study lacks ecological validity. Allport and Postman's study as well is also widely misreported by psychologists and if you see the picture on the screen here, some psychologists when writing up or referring to the study of Allport and Postman have said that this was the picture that was originally shown to participants when in fact it wasn't. Now it's very possible that you will get a question in which you have to apply the theory of reconstructive memory to a scenario. So for example, there's an example question on the screen if you want to have a go at for revision.